Thanks, Rita. You're watching Southeast today. Our top story tonight a stark warning after a manicure went horribly wrong for this young girl with nail glue bought online. It's actually scarred her for life like that because as a parent, uh, that warning's going to always be there in my mind now, whatever product Chloe would want to use. A Kent sub postmaster has told how he was asked to repay stolen money after an armed robbery. There was no concern about us at all. All they wanted was to get as much money off us. Strong community reactions as another public meeting is held over plans to house asylum seekers at the North Eye site in Sussex. Our reporter Fiona is there with the very latest. I'm here in Maidstone where players and fans of the town's football club are preparing for the biggest match in its history. 4,000 ticket holders are praying for another cup shock as they head to Championship High Flyers Ipswich Town. Hello, welcome to the programme. I'm Ellie Crissell. We begin tonight with the 11-year-old girl from Kent who needed skin grafts after suffering burns from nail glue during a do-it-yourself manicure. Chloe's mother Stacy from Sheerness now wants to warn others about the product bought from a discount website which she feels shouldn't have been on sale. This report from Victoria Bourne and a warning you may find some of the content upsetting. I've got them here, so these are the ones I was trying to stick on. Chloe had been hoping to have a nice manicure for Christmas, but it all went horribly wrong when she tried applying false nails at home. All of a sudden, I f the, the glue spilled. I didn't realise it spilled on this. The, I was leaning on this package and it spilled. Obviously, I didn't see it. I put my hands in. The package was getting stuck. I was trying to like get it off and then... Um, yeah, I've just gone, it's burning, it's burning. The glue left her skin so badly burnt, she ended up at the specialist burns unit at the Queen Victoria Hospital in East Grinstead, where she had a skin graft on both hands. The pain that she went through was horrendous. The cleaning of it was horrendous. Um, when they operated, she actually had to be put to sleep. As for any parent standing there, that is something that's not nice to see. So, yeah, it was quite traumatic. The day of my operation, I was a little bit scared. It's my first operation I've ever had, so it was a bit scary. The product she used was a cyanoacrylate-based nail glue. We checked online, and it's still for sale on multiple websites. At the moment, online marketplaces don't have a legal responsibility to check that what they sell is safe. And so that means that you are putting your health at risk when you buy from these websites. And so what we think should happen is that they should have some legal responsibility to do checks on their products, because when you go on the high street, those retailers are responsible for what's being sold. We contacted the online selling platform the family used. It insists the product did carry warnings to keep it out of the reach of children. But Stacey thinks it should be removed from sale. I think that this nail glue should be completely banned and not sold. I personally, me, will not be using nail glue and Chloe will not be having nail glue again. It certainly puts Chloe off having fake nails. Victoria Bourne, BBC South East Today, Sheerness. Hundreds of people are attending a public meeting in Sussex over plans for a new migrant detention centre near Becks Hill. The Home Office said last year that it was looking to house asylum seekers at the North Eye site, a Category C prison, for over 39 years until 1992. It's been unused since 2010, but the site was bought last year by the government for £15 million. Their plans could see up to 1,200 migrants housed there. Well, today's meeting was organised by the town's MP. I met the Home Secretary just a couple of weeks ago. This is only being looked at as a closed, detained site. It's not being looked at in any other form. What they can't give any, uh, any conclusion on is to whether it's going to go ahead at all. But I've had confirmation that it's only being looked at as a closed site, whereas when, at the very start of this journey, it was going to be mooted as an open site. And of course, that's where people are concerned. Well, Fiona is outside St. Augustine's Church in Bexhill. That's where that meeting has been happening. Hello, Fiona. Now, this has been rumbling on for quite some time, but they still don't have a final decision from the Home Office on what's going to happen. 
That's right, Ellie, and it's the second time this decision has been delayed. The final decision was due to be made by the Home Office this month. That's now not going to happen because a number of surveys and assessments are needing to be completed. In fact, when we were at the site this afternoon, somebody was carrying out a survey. And all of these delays lead to a sort of unsettled feeling for locals. And for some, there is strong resistance against the plans. Basically, people here don't want it. And it's as simple as that? Yeah. There's nothing in it for us. Um, people have tried to persuade us that there'll be some work in it, but when you talk to local trades, like our friends who are chippies or, or decorators, they don't want to work there. There's nothing in it for us. So basically it's nimbyism? It, we, we don't want it, yeah. Um, and yes, we don't want it. Um, yeah, obviously we would rather it didn't go ahead, you know, and all the stuff that goes with it. But, you know, if it is a detention centre and they're not wandering around all over the place, then I'd, I'd, I'd be OK with that. Yeah, you think, what's the point if you don't know what's going to happen? You don't want to spend money doing, you know, up a place that's not worth anything at the end of the day. Are you worried about your house price? Oh, it, well, it's already dropped, so we're basically stuck here. Um, yeah, they no one I want to buy, so we're prisoners ourselves. Well, Hugh Merriman is currently talking to a packed church trying to allay some of those fears. The Home Office says that these detention centres are needed to try to address the unacceptable cost of housing migrants in hotels, which they say is costing the taxpayer £8 million a day. Fiona, thank you. A Kent sub-postmaster has revealed how the post office asked him to pay back money that was stolen from his branch following an armed robbery. Jonathan Brenton, who ran a post office in Charing near Ashford, had more than £2,000 stolen from his branch in a raid in 2012. The post office wrote to him the following month to tell him he was liable for more than £1,700 of it. He was one of a number of former sub-postmasters asked to repay money stolen from their post offices by robbers. He's been speaking to Seema Katecha. John is a former sub-postmaster. In 2012, his post office in Kent was robbed. They stole more than £2,000. A knife was being held against my throat. I was being pushed against the safe. Um, so when I was asked to empty the contents of the safe, I knew I would have to move in a way that would put me in further danger. But he says the post office was unsympathetic and formal in its response, telling him he was liable for most of the money because he kept more cash in the safe than he was supposed to. The tone of that letter was appalling. Um, we nearly closed the branch there and then. Um, we realised there was no empathy, there was no concern about us at all. All they wanted was to get as much money off us as possible. John's contract with the post office, like many others, stated the sub-postmaster is responsible for all losses caused through his own negligence, carelessness or error and also for losses of all kinds caused by his assistance. Deficiencies due to such losses must be made good without delay. In 2019, a High Court judge found important aspects of the post office's contracts to have been unfair. He decided that it was for the post office to prove that losses had been caused by the fault of the sub-postmasters, not the other way round, as the post office had insisted for years. So this was uh, where we had the shop area. John vehemently denies being negligent, saying the post office hadn't repaired the security door or the alarm system. So it happened there? Into the secure area, yes. The crime and the way he says it was handled had a heavy toll on him and his ex-husband. He wrote to the then newly appointed chief executive, Paula Venels, saying, Honestly, this situation has got so bad that my partner confessed he has been contemplating suicide. He says there was no reply. There was never any compassion from post office. Um, so you just have this very strong sense of anger towards them um, that has never gone away. In the end, the matter was dropped and he didn't have to pay the money stolen.
Like many of those we spoke to, ultimately they didn't have to pay, but some did. They're convinced this culture of blame continues. They argue unless there is radical change in the management and the operation of the post office, they won't be satisfied these abuses won't happen again. Seema Katecha reporting from Charing. Well, Piers Hopkirk joins us now. Piers, it's yet more controversy for the post office. Absolutely. In the wake of the Horizon software scandal, the post office and its management have been under unprecedented scrutiny. And as you say, yet more bed bad headlines for them to face. Now, in response to our story, they've told us they were sorry to hear of Jonathan Brenton's experience. And they've given us this statement. They've said, over recent years, we've made significant enhancements to the support we offer postmasters and their staff who are the victims of attempted or actual robberies. Whenever there's an incident of crime, we take the lessons from that to help improve the security for all postmasters across our network. But clearly, as you've seen there from Jonathan Brenton, his experiences had a huge impact on him and, of course, on his relationship with the post office. Piers, thank you. A teenager has been sentenced to 13 years in prison after stabbing a woman multiple times in a car park in Hastings. 18-year-old Thomas Whaling had taken a knife from the kitchen of a friend's home. The victim suffered a punctured lung and other wounds after the attack in front of the Summerfields Leisure Centre in May last year. A man who crashed a drone at a concert on Brighton Beach has been convicted in what's thought to be the first case of its kind in court. Giles Dolby lost control of the drone he was flying, which then crashed into the stage during a live music concert in 2022. He's been fined around £800. Events take place across the southeast tomorrow for Holocaust Memorial Day, observed on the anniversary of the liberation of the Auschwitz-Birkenau concentration camp. This year's theme will be Fragility of Freedom. In Hastings, a special service has been organised by the family of 90-year-old Emmy Tasker, who experienced firsthand the horrors of the Nazi regime while living in the Netherlands, as Peter Whittlesey reports. Emmy was born in the Netherlands in 1933, but after the Nazi invasion just seven years later, her life and that of her whole family was to change forever, simply because they were Jewish. Her childhood was one of hiding and keeping one step ahead of the Jew hunters. First time I stayed with um, a gamekeeper's house, me and my uh, second brother, and we stayed there. But I don't know how long for, but we had to go because one day um, the um, Jew hunters came to catch me and then we were transferred to Rotterdam. But nobody told me. I didn't know it was Rotterdam. Oh, we were just taken on the train with this very brave young man, Vincent he was called. Until the liberation of the Netherlands, Emmy was hiding in a butcher's in Rotterdam. Her brother was just a street away in a greengrocer's, but they never met for fear of being caught. Three quarters of the Dutch Jews were murdered during the Second World War, the highest number of victims of the Holocaust in Western Europe. Remarkably, Emmy, her three brothers and her parents survived, but her mother's family didn't. That's why I'm telling my son all these things because I I'm sorry I never asked my mum anything because she lost her father her mother her sisters uh, their husbands children uncles aunts none of them returned that may have been decades ago, but for many survivors like Emmy, the pain is still there. And that's why tomorrow on Holocaust Memorial Day, they will remember the six million Jews who were systematically murdered. Peter Whittlesey, BBC South East Today, Pet Level. It's just after a quarter to seven. A reminder of our top story tonight. The mother of an 11-year-old girl from Kent is warning about the dangers of buying beauty products from discount websites after her daughter needed skin grafts due to burns she suffered from a nail glue during a home manicure. 
And it's been a lovely day today and there's some more sunshine to come tomorrow, but a frost overnight tonight. What about the rest of the weekend? I'll give you a full forecast later on in the programme. To football now and Maidstone United are preparing for one of the biggest games in their history. Tomorrow they travel to Championship High Flyers Ipswich in the FA Cup fourth round. It's the furthest they've ever got in the competition. They'll play in a 30,000 capacity stadium against the side which has previously won the competition and also lifted European silverware in the 1980s under legendary manager Bobby Robson. Well, our sports reporter James Dunn is at Gallagher Stadium live for us this evening in Maidstone. Hello, James. I imagine there's a real buzz of excitement behind the scenes there. Absolutely. In fact, excitement has been building here for the last three weeks since that incredible moment when the fans stormed the pitch here at the Gallagher after they got an against all odds win against League One Stevenage. And this was the spot where Sam Corn stepped up to score the penalty, which turned out to be the only goal of the game and set up this fixture against Ipswich Town. And Maidstone have got 4,000 fans going to Ipswich tomorrow. It'll be the biggest crowd that any Maidstone United team has ever played in front of. I think the players who I've talked to do admit that they'll need a bit of luck to go their way if they hope to win tomorrow. But whatever happens, well, there's already so much to be proud of about what's been an incredible FA Cup run. First round, second round, third round. For his club, it's caught. And they might as well have won the cup. What a journey it's been to get here for the club and fans. The biggest result in Maidstone's United's history. Maidstone United have played six fixtures to reach this stage and they've delivered on everything the FA Cup is all about. Magic and drama. Sam Corn's penalty in front of a home crowd to take them to the fourth round will be forever etched in club history. His biggest moment marked with a tissue up his nose. It's Corn! It's 1-0 Maidstone United! Such an iconic moment and I've got um, a, a little bit of tissue stopping my nose from bleeding, but yeah, listen, I, I've had a lot of laughs from people and my friends and family saying about it, but I think it makes that moment even special. This week, the task of training and preparing as best they can to take on Ipswich Town, a side sitting some 97 places above them in the football pyramid. Maidstone are in the National League South after being relegated last season, but this cup run has more than made up for it. One of the highlights of my managerial career, obviously, um, it's not about me, it's about our football club, our community, Maidstone United as a whole, um, what this means to us. Um, it's a historic moment um, and we have to go there and enjoy the occasion competing against um, a championship side. In the club shop, they're selling bespoke scarves for the fixture and the four and a half thousand fans travelling to Portman Road will be an army of amber and black. Manic is the word that keeps being mentioned, to be honest. It really has been, yeah, all hands to the pumps and to get everything done and try and get everything done. Hence, we're here early before the game to get the stock out of boxes and onto our shelves ready. The history of the two sides may be very different. Ipswich lifted the cup in 1978, Maidstone folded in the 90s. There may be a gulf between them, but if there's one club that can make the path to round five difficult for the Tractor Boys, it's the Stones. This is a road trip when anything could happen. It is, after all, the FA Cup. Juliet Park in BBC South East Today. Well, as you can imagine, this game is the talk of the town, but it doesn't stop people training here on a Friday night. And Lorraine here is the head of disability. Uh, Lorraine, of course, the men's first team gets all the attention, but there are so many different people who are part of this club. That's right, we've got, like you say, 20 disability teams, we've got women's girls walking football, and a massive community of all, all kinds of football for everyone, really, so it's brilliant here. Not only do you run all that, you also help dish out the tickets on a Saturday. Yeah, I was here doing the car park at half seven. The first one arrived at 6.30, and obviously I was the one to give the news that we'd sold the last ticket, so it was quite heartbreaking, really. <laughs> and uh, uh, that wasn't you, Ron. Uh, you were in that queue, but you were one of the lucky ones. We were one of the lucky ones. Uh, we queued for three hours in the freezing cold last weekend, and fortunately, 
uh, we got the last tick or 20, 20 uh, tickets in front of us and uh, it was brilliant but uh, feel sorry for so many people behind us. And you got a bit of attention from the manager? Oh he's brilliant, uh, the Steve, Steve's uh, ticket allocation, he actually came out at the front of the queue was shaking people's hands. It is such a friendly guy and it's a, it is a lovely community club there. Uh, well. well you can see there's a real strong connection people have. Sandra, uh, tomorrow you guys are going up on the coach. Yes, we're going up on the coach. We've got 4,500 fans going up, five coaches loading up and people going on the train, some going by car. It's going to be an amazing day. It's just brilliant. It's going to be quite an atmosphere on that coach, I bet. It's going to be rock and rolling on that coach. <laughs> <laughs> and so you two, Alfie, CJ, I've got to ask you, um, what's going to happen tomorrow? We're going to win. Yeah, I think Sam Corn's going to score two. Yeah, I'm going to win the game. I just think Sam Corn's only going to score one. <laughs> well, well, I hope he does. Uh, he's already had two so far in the cup run and I'm sure he'll get another one, let's hope, anyway. So, it is going to be an amazing day tomorrow, but you can't talk about a record-breaking cup run without talking about what's come before for this club with such a rich history. The town was buzzing. It was an exciting time to be and it was like a, a really fun place to be, the characters we had in the team. We used to score so, so many goals as a, as a, cl a club in a, a front four. Steve Butler collected his 13th goal of the season. I, I can't remember the exact numbers, but I think every one of us got over 20 goals, goals that yeah. year. I'm sorry to Butler, goal, yes! Maidstone United are challenging for promotion from the fourth division in their very first season. It, it was, thinking back, it was, uh, it was unbelievable, really. But this most memorable season was played away, their Maidstone ground not fit for the Football League and sold off for retail space. And we were playing in Dartford, ground sharing on wet, windy, muddy evenings and uh, yeah, it, it didn't feel like a golden era. And things soon went south with efforts to build a new ground in Maidstone sparking a bitter planning row and a chain of events that would eventually lead to the club's demise. Outside, the Maidstone fans kept up the pressure in the best way they know, but inside the battle for their stadium was being fought and lost. The recommendation, which is one of refusal on the grounds outlined on the papers, has been carried. Maidstone United are dead dead and buried by those people up there who say they represent the people of this town. They don't represent the people of this town, they represent their own interests. Maidstone supporters had been keeping a close eye on the news, fully expecting today's shareholders meeting to announce the winding up of the 95-year-old club. But unfortunately, we start with the sad news that 3rd Division Maidstone United were today forced to resign from the Football League. We won't go into all the politics and everything because that, that's in the past, we forget that, but it took us We've got 20 years to come back to the town. The Gallagher is a symbol of this club's road to redemption. But now there are finally signs of a new golden era for the Amber Army. This is good. Oh no, what a goal for the Maidstone boy! Once it left my boot, I just knew that it was going to cause a keep all sorts of problems and it just flew into that top corner. I was born here, grew up here. All my friends and family are from here, so yeah, I've got that sort of special connection with the club. Having that uh, moment that people will probably remember for a very long time, yeah, it's a um, really nice feeling. It's a club with more than a hundred years of history, but now for the first time in decades, fans can start to believe that the best times may lie ahead. So many memorable moments there and another one this weekend. Elsewhere tomorrow, Brighton and Hove Albion's men go to Sheffield United, also in the FA Cup fourth round. While in the Women's Super League, the Seagulls host Chelsea. Gillingham travel to Milton Keynes Dons in League Two. But of course, the big news this weekend is tomorrow's game kicks off at 12.30. And Ellie, plenty of ways to follow on the BBC. Indeed, there are. Thank you very much, James. Thank you for that. Very exciting weekend, of course. Yes, full Maidstone commentary on BBC Radio Kent tomorrow, so do tune in. And you can read about the club's history on our website and by listening to a special radio documentary on BBC Sounds, charting the club's highs and lows.
time now for a look at the weekend weather. John Hammond is with us and it's looking rather nice for all this football, isn't yes, it? Yes, dare I say it's spring-like. Of course, uh, Ellie was asking me earlier on what the summer's going to be like. I mean, <laughs> blimey, she's very demanding, isn't she? Um, we can't even tell you what February's going to be like, in all honesty. Uh, these blooms here will be hoping we don't get a cold snap, but I suspect we will see winter fighting back before too long. But yeah, today, as Ellie said, it was fantastic. This was a typical scene across the southeast, and guess what? We're going to get a lot more lovely sunshine as we go through this weekend. But it is cold out there this evening after that uh, fine day. It's going to be a chilly old night tonight and we could well see a touch of frost first thing. But we are set fair for the weekend and it's going to get even milder actually as we head through the last few days of January. But it is cooling off right now. Temperatures I've noticed are already as low as what three or four degrees and they'll continue to tumble as we head through the evening and overnight. So yeah, a touch of frost, particularly in some rural areas. And uh, I think the numbers could be a little bit lower than this suggests so some spots could get as low as what minus two minus three degrees so some slippery surfaces first thing touch of frost yes but so that won't last long and we are set to have a beautiful day a bit like today maybe a bit more breeze a bit more cloud but that won't spoil things at all and temperatures will bounce back after that uh, cold start so we'll be as high as what eight nine possibly 10 degrees. If you're heading out to any sporting events, if you're going up to Portman Road, for example, for the big one there, it should stay dry and fine. This is above par for the time of year. Another cold one tomorrow night. Again, there could be a touch of frost. Sunday, well, another mostly fine day. There will be thicker cloud just to our north and west. Uh, but for most of us, for most of the day, it's going to be another fine one, if anything, milder. So more of us getting up into double figures, despite the fact that there will be a freshening breeze coming up from the south. You'll notice that through the afternoon, but to 10 to 12 degrees is uh, much milder than it typically is at this time of year. Plenty more to come as we head into the early part of next week. As I mentioned, we're going to keep the cold air mostly at bay. There's a chance it might get a little bit chillier for a time through the early part of next week than that mild air burst back in again from the southwest, keeping the blues well at bay. So as we close January, no sign of any frost or snow. The other thing to point out is there's going to be a lot of dry weather. It's been uh, pretty soggy at times, hasn't it, through January. That's not going to be the case as we head towards February. Not much in the way of frost, certainly not much in the way of snow. We'll keep you posted on the rest of February and Ellie will keep you posted on the summer when we know. I don't think it's unreasonable to ask you about the summer forecast in Completely. January. <laughs> Thank you very much, John. That's it from me and John and everyone. Claudia Sabasis, though, is back with your late news at 10.30. Bye-bye.